Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. On God. On God. I don't know if you've ever had a kid who's like come up to you with a stick and, you know, they were wielding it like a sword and they said, on guard. Yes, well, on guard. That is the beginning of today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day. So I thought, you know what? Let's lead on with that. Let's see if we could uh, get on guard this morning. What are you What are you guarding? How are you guarding your heart? In what ways does your life need to be guarded against the schemes and the tactics of the enemy on God. Uh, Just practice saying it. It'll make you smile. Trust me. Um, Yeah, it's really impossible to strike the on guard pose, um, particularly with like a plastic sword or, you know, a stick from the yard that's a sword. You know, if you were to strike that pose, like, let me just just trust me, like you're you're going to smile. It's it's going to result in a smile because it's a um. Yeah, I don't know. It's like a swashbuckling kid style on God. But it's real. It's a real calling. It's a biblical calling. Uh, good morning. I'm Carmen LeBurge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. And we're going to get on guard this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Really, I think that um, the person who selected this month's Growing Your Faith verses, you know, the our theme is love and the way in which the love of God is manifest not only in us, but God intends his love to be manifested through us into the lives of others. And so I suspect that um, we're supposed to be highlighting the end of the verse, (laughs) which is do everything in love. And we'll get there. Oh, yes, we'll get there. But first, we're going to begin where the verse begins, which is on God. All right. So be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. This is a muscular love. Let me just go ahead and tell you that doing everything in love, following a list like this, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous and be strong. This is no wimpy love. This is no, um, yeah, super sugary dissolving kind of love. This is a this is a muscular love. This is a cross of Jesus kind of love. This is the love in the way God has loved you kind of love. So when we talk about being on guard, what are we on guard against? Um, Think of Nehemiah inviting people to stand on what was then just a rubble heap as they were rebuilding the walls uh, of the temple and of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, It had been laid siege so many times that uh, it was lying in ruins. But as they rebuilt, with one hand, they were on guard with the other hand. That is the posture here. Yes, yes, do everything in love, a love that is patient and kind and never boastful or arrogant or rude, but also a love that knows the cost of loving. Do everything in love in the spirit of the God who is love. And that's not a weak or wimpy kind of love. That's a muscular love. That's a love that recognizes that we're constantly under threat. That's a love that does guard not only your heart and mind, but stands on guard against the schemes of the enemy as he seeks to devour not only us, but those around us and those we love. Be on guard today. Stand firm in the faith. What does that mean? Well, first of all, you have to know the faith. You have to be a person of the faith, the faith once delivered to the saints. Be courageous. That's moral courage oftentimes in the world today. Yes, I mean, it's it's the kind of courage that steps up and steps forward um, when someone weak needs defending 
when some unrighteous thing is happening in the culture. But it's also a moral courage to do what's right the first time and every time. So what does it look like in your life today to be on guard, to stand firm in the faith, to be courageous and to be strong? Where in your world, in the world that you inhabit, in the decisions that you're going to face today, in the places you're going to walk, in the people you're going to meet, what is it going to look like today? Doing everything in love, because love's covering it all here. Doing everything in love, what does it look like to be appropriately on guard, standing firm in the faith, being courageous and strong? You're familiar with the uh, the, web, the web telescope, yes? <clears throat> well, some new images have been released that are described as mind-blowing, revealing 19 galaxies never observed before, densely populated spiral galaxies. Now, densely populated here um, must, uh, must be unpacked because we're talking here about um, light. We're talking about stars. When we say deeply populated or densely populated, um, we're, we tend to be talking about people, but here we're not talking about people. We're talking about how close together um, these light reflecting places are. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the lead paragraph here from CNN. The James Webb Space Telescope has captured scintillating images of 19 spiral galaxies and the millions of stars that call them home in unprecedented detail never seen before by astronomers. What I want you to take note of here, well, first of all, we should take note of the fact that the universe is really, really big um, and really, really, really far away. <laughs> And so I think that's um, when we talk about the majesty of God and the scope of God's um, creation and the reality of, well, frankly, just how small we are, right? All of that is a part of this conversation. But I wanted to highlight briefly um, the, the use of language here as if stars themselves are alive in a way that you and I, in the same way that you and I are alive. For someone to call, well, again, again, someone, right? It's even hard for me to figure out how to talk about this without stumbling over the anthropomorphism. Stars are being anthropomorphized here. Um, when we start talking about them being populated or them actually being the populace, and when we talk about stars um, calling a galaxy home, first of all, stars aren't calling. They're not speaking not in the way that we have come to understand that term. And stars aren't calling 19 spiral galaxies 34 million light years away um, home. That's, that's language that I think is rightly reserved for people and places um, and the reality of home. And so I don't want to reduce the reality of home to just something that is, frankly, at this point, so far away and lost in space that we could never get there. Because home is where the heart is, and each and every one of us is on a journey home to the Father's house. And Jesus shows us the way. In fact, he is the way and the truth and the life. Have you found your way home? Have you allowed yourself to be found by the one who came to take you home? I hope so. His name is Jesus. If you don't know him, we really want you to. That's what Faith Radio is all about. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBerge, and we'll continue our conversation together in just a moment. I'm Carmen LaBerge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. I have a few things to share with you this morning. Um, first of all, um, there were a lot of folks who participated in something called Dry January. Um, for many of them, that is over, and today is Friday. Um, and they, um, their bodies are not going to be as ready for the intake of alcohol that they are going to consume this weekend. And so... This is like the prime weekend for DUIs. 
<clears throat> for people, to, well, I don't know if they'll all get stopped. I don't know if they will all get stopped, but there will be a lot of people um, who think they have a tolerance that they no longer have following um, following a fast. And I would say keep fasting. Um, if you participated in dry January, why not um, just continue that practice? It's not just good for you personally. It's good for all of us collectively. Uh, now, in terms of like, social trends and things that are happening out there in the culture. Following dry January, there is something called flip phone February. What? Yes. Uh, People are actually going to fast from their smartphones and the use of smartphones during the month of February. That is going to not just um, change the the folks who do that, um, very potentially improving their marriages and their mental health, It's also going to radically change our relationship with each and every one of them. Um, We have become not only dependent on our smartphones um, for the way we do our work and the way we communicate with our families and how we get our news and how we post information about what's happening in our lives to others. We've also now been wired to imagine that people respond to us and will respond to us instantaneously over, you know, any number of platforms. But if people are genuinely going to fast from their smartphones and go to flip phone February, they're not going to have access to all of that instant information, nor are they going to be in a position to instantly respond. And so if you are participating in flip phone February, I really encourage you to communicate with the folks who are used to you responding. They've become accustomed to you responding to them in real time because, in fact, you are now not going to be doing that. <laughs> you're, you're just not. There's not going to be any notifications. There will be no, no alerts. Text messages will come in, yes, on a, um, on a flip phone, but emails won't, and you won't be getting um, any other kind of alerts from any of the other platforms that you are ordinarily used to accessing on your phone, which also means that like when your bank sends you an alert, you're not you're not going to get it in the same kind of way that you've gotten it in the past. Like all of those kinds of things are a part of this conversation. But it's a good conversation to be having, particularly if you have young people um, in your family. Maybe everybody do a flip phone February. Maybe do it together. Might be an interesting exercise. Being a mom... Um, was never intended to be a solo experience. And let me just say that to every person functioning today as a single mom. Um, That's just not what God intended. And so if you're feeling today like you, you can't do it alone, it's because you were never meant to do it alone. And this is not a, a condemnation of the reality in which we now live where a really an overwhelming percentage of children are not being raised in in a household where both their biological mom and biological dad are present. And so we now live in a time when we have to forge families for our kids because every kid needs a mom and a dad. It's just not intended to be something that takes that that takes place all by oneself. And so I want to tell you about a mom um and I want to tell you about a family and I want to tell you about forging families in America today. But I want to start with this. Do you remember Moses? Do you remember the story of Moses? Do you remember Moses's mom? Maybe this story is new to you, but um, there was a period of time in which the people that we know now as Israel, they were just called the Hebrews at the time. They were slaves in Egypt. So after... um, after the days of Joseph, when you know Joseph was highly regarded, of course, he had been sold into slavery by his brothers into Egypt. So it's not like a happy tale. But Joseph had served so admirably and so faithfully over so many generations that he had found great favor um, with Pharaoh. Well, that time period is no longer remembered. Um, people don't remember Joseph anymore. And the Hebrew people are now generationally enslaved in Egypt. But they continue to um, be 
be strong. God continues to bless them. God continues to bless their families, and they are a growing population. And that becomes um, a threat. At least Pharaoh imagines that is a threat. And so he wants to initiate some population control upon the Hebrew people who are enslaved in Egypt. And his methodology for doing that, the way he wants to see this carried out, is that the people who deliver the Hebrew babies, so these are called the Hebrew midwives, he instructs them that if a, if a little girl is born, she can live, but if a little boy is born, he must die. And so it was a nationwide um, mandate for infanticide of all of the male babies born to the Hebrew women enslaved in Egypt in the days um, the days in which Moses was born. So the fact that there is a Moses and that there is a story of Moses means um, that that was not carried out in the life of this one little boy. And I want to talk about the Moses laws in the United States of America and a boy living in America today whose name is Samuel. That story up next here on Mornings with Carmen. What season of life are you in right now? Season of life. There are lots of ways to answer that question. So what season of life are you in right now? You may feel as if you are in a season of hopeful expectation or a season of desperation. You may feel as if you are in a dry season or a rainy season or maybe a season of abundance. Maybe this is a transitional season for you. What season of life are you in right now? Let me say first that you're not alone in whatever season you are in. And let me also say that God wants to meet you and be with you in that current season, even in that season of wilderness or dryness. And God wants to lead you through that current season to the next one. Discover what God is doing in your life now and where he's leading next at this year's Set Apart Conference for Women. It's March 8 and 9 at the University of Northwestern St. Paul. You can register today at setapartconference.com. That's setapartconference.com. If you've ever watched the Netflix series, This Is Us, then the idea that somebody might leave a newborn at a fire station um, is not is not new information. But what you might not know is that it's actually legal in all 50 states um, there are safe haven or baby Moses laws, um, giving parents a safe and legal choice where they can leave their their infant. Um, you can do it at a hospital, at a fire station, um, in a standalone emergency. I don't think they call them emergency rooms because they're, they're like these standalone facilities, but you, you get the idea. Um, uh, or an EMS station. And so we have talked here uh, together about um, the safe haven laws and the um, the baby boxes, right? That that are installed in um, fire stations and hospitals across the country. Um, and this is one of those stories. And so I thought the fact that these are called baby Moses laws. You know, we have Good Samaritan laws in some places as well. These are opportunities for Christians in the culture to point to something that is happening and say, "Do you know that story? Do you do you know the story of baby Moses?" I find it a little bit curious that in 2024 in the United States of America, we've got something called baby Moses laws. Um, Moses' mother, Jochebed, she was a Hebrew woman living in slavery in Egypt in the days of the pharaohs. She was um, the daughter of a Levite. So, you know, she's a, she's a PK. She's a pastor's kid. She is um, raised in the faith, as a person of faith, to be a person of faith. She marries a Levite named Amram. And Jochebed, Jochebed and Amram, they, they have children. We don't know how many, but they at least have um, a little girl before they have Moses. And then we don't know if the little girl who stands as a lookout in the story, we don't know if that's Miriam, who we also know is Moses' sister and meet later in the story as an adult. So it's possible that the same little girl who was on lookout is Miriam. But what we do know is Moses certainly had a sister, maybe more than one. 
We also know that Moses had a brother. His name is Aaron. You can read their stories in the book of Exodus. They appear in chapter 2, in chapter 6, in chapter 15. Those are, you know, so, so read the book of Exodus and, and remind yourself or learn for the first time about the story of this person named Moses um, who lived thousands of years ago, but after whom laws are named in the United States of America in 2024. I just, first of all, find that kind of staggering. Moses was born in a day and a time and under circumstances that you and I would prefer not to imagine, but these things do still happen in the world. Um, Much like we would prefer to imagine that a mom in the United States of America today would not find herself with so few resources and so little hope that her best hope would be to leave her child in a safe haven baby box and walk away. But that's what happened to Samuel two years ago now. Two years ago, Samuel was born to a mom who, well, we don't know her name. We don't know anything about her. But what we do know is to save her child, she did something as desperate as Moses' as Moses's mother did in the days in which he was born. No, no, the mom in uh, Kentucky didn't weave together a basket and cover it with pitch and put her infant son in it and send him down the river. But she did wrap her newborn infant carefully and deliver him to a safe place in a safe haven baby box and rang the bell and walked away. In the days of Jochebed, As a Hebrew slave in Egypt, with the ruler of the age decreeing that all the Hebrew boys would be killed upon their birth, um, she felt desperate. You could think here about China's failed one-child policy in our lifetime, or you could think about abortion laws in America today, but there's a lot of desperation. We know the story of the book of Moses from the book of Exodus. Today, I want you to know the story of Samuel. So Samuel was surrendered on the second day of his life at a fire station. But Samuel was already being prayed for and loved by the Ryan family. When they saw the story, they prayed. And they prayed for him specifically. Um, He came into their custody as a foster child a couple of weeks later. And he has remained um, in their family ever since. And in December, he formally became their adopted son. And they named him Samuel. First Samuel one twenty seven says, I prayed for this child and the Lord granted my request. Now, what do you know about Samuel in the Bible? Samuel's mother was Hannah. You can read her story um, in the book that bears the name of her son. Suffice it to say, families are complicated. Motherhood is complicated. God knits families together in all kinds of ways. And God has knit you into his family by faith. There is a theology of adoption um, that's imperative to understand. And all of these stories that we're talking about today, the story of Moses, who is adopted into the family of Pharaoh and raised by Pharaoh's daughter himself. Little Samuel, Ryan, who has been adopted into a family You and I, who have the privilege of adoption into the family of faith. I bring this up today because there are an awful lot of kids who need a home and need a family. They don't just need a home, they need a family. And um, some of their lives are very, very complicated. There's a NICU nurse who has now adopted, formally adopted a 14-year-old girl who a year ago or a couple of years ago had triplets. I want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine that this was this young, very young teenager who had three babies and no one came to sit with her in the NICU. She's now been adopted by a NICU nurse. The mother of three has been adopted into a family of five. It's now a family of nine. 
I'm so thankful that God has room in his heart of hearts for you and me. I'm so glad that, you know, God's house, God's home never runs out of space, never runs out of um, love. What about you and me? We've got space, we got love, we got room. We're going to continue our conversation um, here in just a moment. Um, our friend Dan DeWitt is going to join us. Um, but before he does, let me ask uh, let me ask one more question on this on this Groundhog Day, because the nation's attention is going to be <laughs> largely turned today, um, or at least in some cases, to a groundhog whose name is Puxatani Phil. Now he's not the original Puxatani Phil, obviously, because groundhogs don't live this long. But it is kind of an interesting custom, and it is an opportunity for you and I to enter into a cultural conversation of the day with a little, with a little, uh, with a little humor. Scientists have now figured out why, why um, groundhogs do this. They've been hibernating, and uh, they they got this, um, you know, this signal that spring has arrived. So what are they popping their little heads out to look for? Are they looking for the sun? Are they looking for the shadow? No, you know what you know what they're looking for, come to find out? They're looking for other groundhogs. So on this um, Groundhog Day, could you pop your head out? Look for some of those other hibernating mammals <laughs> known as human beings. Could you check in on somebody today? Spring's coming, we know that. Resurrection is on the horizon, we know that. But for a lot of folks, we're just in the middle of the dead of winter. And some people are feeling dead in winter. So could you pop your little head out today? Of your little hidey hole, whatever that looks like, wherever that is, and check on somebody today? During this month of February, we're going to make sure that those who are lonely among us don't feel too lonely and get checked up on and checked in on. So let's start that on this Groundhog Day. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Next up, our brother Dan DeWitt will join us. We're going to talk about something called the photocopy syndrome. Yeah, I got no idea what that is, so we'll let him read us in. Have a great, uh, I was going to say have a great day, but just have a great moment. And we'll be right back. Dan DeWitt is joining us again today. He is the director for the Center of Worldview and Culture at Southwest Baptist University, and he blogs at theolatte.com. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Carmen. You know what I got to say. What's, What's crack a <laughs> Yeah. What's crack a this Groundhog yeah. Day? Yeah. Yeah, on this Groundhog Day. So um, we have groundhogs where I live, and... Um, I don't know. I don't know that I will go out looking. I know where their holes are. Like this is the other thing. Like they dig giant. They are. They yes. are. Yeah. They they eat a lot of fruit and vegetables. If you have a garden or an orchard, and they dig these giant holes. So it's not hard to know. You know, it's like it's not like you got to wonder whether or not your own version of Puxatani Phil is going to pop up somewhere. I mean, if he's going to pop up, it's going to be right there. <laughs> That's right. It's like kind of asking, like, where where has the vandalist, someone doing vandalism, where have they been? Well, you'll know. It's kind of like <laughs> exactly. spray painted all over. And you know yeah. who does a great Pugzatani? Is that my saying right? Pugzatani Phil voice. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, it's it is your producer. Yeah. Well, Paul Paul's does all the voices. Amazing. He does. He is. Paul, do you have something? Talented. Paul, do you have something you want to say in the Tuxapani in the Pugzatani Phil <laughs> voice? Well, a few years ago. I put together a, a PSA from all of us animals like, you know, Puxatawney Phil and, and General Beauregard Lee and all these other groundhogs. Sonny the Groundhog, uh, uh, what is it, Sun, down in Sun Prairie. Jimmy the Groundhog, that is. And, you know, here's the deal. Why are you waking us up? I mean, <laughs> you wake up our wives and our kids and, you know, it takes a long time to get the kids back to bed. Maybe to back almost a month and by that time it's time to get up you wonder why we're so surly all the time it's <laughs> listen it's just an averages Paul. game it, it <laughs> about the weather it's a, 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 never mind just mm-hmm. just let us sleep okay all right Dr. Back Dr. Scott. <laughs> back this i love that i love that Paul's such a good one. Yeah. 
You you made that happen, Dan. That's all I want to say about that. I you did. Made that happen. You made I that did. Happen. I hope that someone smiled because of. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And it sounds a bit like, like Larry the cucumber. Well, <laughs> it is a variation of Larry, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I love my lips. Can All we right, just have fun today, Carmen? Come on. There, yes, there's there's absolutely <laughs> no photocopy of of Paul Perot. He is an original. No. This will be my segue. He, this will be okay. my segue into a conversation <laughs> about the photocopy syndrome, <laughs> trying to fit into places or character roles that are not ours to play. How can we avoid it? And how can we authentically be who God created and called us to be? It's hard, isn't it? It's, it really is hard. And um, I, I think it's it's a, it's credited to Abraham Lincoln. So I'm just giving him the credit for it. Although I tried to, you know, source the, the quotation and just found a lot of people who quote it. But here's the quote. Every man is born an original, but sadly, most men die copies. And I think that's right. I think that a lot of us, for one reason or another, we we drift away from who we know we are in our convictions, in our personalities, in our gifts. Um, we drift away from that because we have this desire to to fit in. And so I included the ever-relevant essay from C.S. Lewis, The Inner Ring, which is really powerful. And if you like sci-fi, Lewis's, um, Lewis's Ransom Trilogy um, deals with this in the final book, which is really great, that hideous strength, that, where he illustrates for us this, this pull to become someone else. And Lewis says that few men realize the moment that they become wicked, this moment where they cross the threshold of being true to what they know is good and true and beautiful, and they laugh at something, Lewis says, um, and illustrates for us in the story, they laugh at something that they don't think is funny. And I think that's such a powerful... Mm insight into this movement away from who we were created to be. And so Lewis says that the the desire to be in the inner ring or to quote, you know, the the play Hamilton, to be in the room where it happened, um, to be in the room where it happens, we often are going to drift away from who we truly are. And Lewis says that this, the inner ring will break us, the desire to be in the inner ring will break us if we don't break it. And so I wanted to write a series and I probably, you know, I had a friend tell me that this probably could become a short little book because I had a lot, the, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, oh, this would be a really good element to add and this would be a good element to add. So I finally had to just cut it off somewhere. Um, but I wanted to write a post reflecting on this urge and then also thinking about what does it look like to be authentic? I think authenticity has to be one of the most powerful forces in the world. When someone gets up and it's just a canned stump speech, I think all of us tune out, whether it's a sermon or, um, you know, a political speech, we just tune out because it's like, that's not real. You're not being real. But when someone's authentic, even if we disagree with that, it's compelling. We It makes us think about why we disagree. Or if we agree with them, it resonates with us at a, a deeper level than someone who's just kind of regurgitating things. And so in the second post in the series, I, I point to a study by NASA that was done in the 60s, and they were looking to find um, a way to better identify creative genius, creative geniuses um, so that in their hiring process, they might have a better way to you know, identify early people who'd be good candidates. And so there, there was a study that was done in, its, in recent years getting more attention, even though it originally originated in the 60s. And they looked at, they began looking at different, at young children. So children who were ages three to five, um, 98% of them um, tested for having the, the traits of being a creative genius, 98%. And that number went down to 30% at age 10. Mm. And by age 15, it was down to 12%. And then when they looked at adults, <clears throat> it was down to 2%. And one of the one of the um, reasons, and of course, you know, big topics like this can never be, you know, all the, you know, like narrowed down to one single cause. But one of the things they thought about is the study looked at two different forms, <clears throat> two 
two different forms of thinking, um, convergent thinking and divergent thinking. And not that either one of them was necessarily better than the other, but what they felt like the educational system was doing was forcing persons to try to synthesize those modes of thinking and do them together at the same time. And the result was that it weakened both. And the result was the loss of this creative genius. And I thought, I thought this study was interesting because it plays into, you know, I think there's a way in which we were created um, to have this creative genius. We were creative to have this powerful influence in the world that's unique to us. But when we try and synthesize who we are with who others want us to be, something significant is lost in the process. There's a there's got to be a conversation in there about conformity and no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing yeah. of your minds. Like that's got to be in there somewhere. We're going to um, we're going to continue unpacking this series of posts by Dan DeWitt. You can find all of them at Theolatte.com. I'm more than happy to send you the direct link. Just text me 877-933-2484. All right, Dan, this is a series of four posts. So I think that takes us through. Um, the content of the second post. Am I right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So let's um let's uh let's talk about posts three and four in just a moment. Let's um let's let's take our break just a couple of couple of seconds early early here. But what has Dan said that has resonated really really deeply with you? Are you a person who feels like you have um, made every attempt to? fit in to groups or to ways of thinking um, and you just know you don't fit. Well, I think what we want to say today is it's, it's okay to not fit in, particularly into a culture that is not walking in the way of the Lord. So what does it look like for you and I as Christians to um, be the original, to be authentically the person that God not only created, but calls and redeems us to be. What does that look like? What does it look like to live as Christ um, in the culture today? So we want our lives to be a photocopy of his, but we don't want um, to be um, forcing ourselves to fit into the molds of the world. So more on this topic, the the series is The Photocopy Syndrome. You can find it at theolatte.com. Again, I'll send you the direct link. Just text me, 877-933-2484. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. We're talking with our friend uh, Daniel DeWitt. You can find what we're talking about at Theolatte.com. Don't miss this week's Worldview Reader as well. Um, today we're talking about a series of posts by Dan, authored by Dan the Man himself. And this series is called The Photocopy Syndrome. So, Dan, remind us what the photocopy syndrome is, and then maybe let's jump into part three of the series. Yeah, the photocopy syndrome is this drift away from who we were created to be. And so it's not being true to who we know God wants us to be, our convictions, our gifts. And because we don't like to be outsiders, we drift towards becoming a photocopy of, of someone else. And that may be a good thing. It may be someone that we really idolize and look up to. It may be someone like, you know, the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But that distinction, you know, Paul said, as I follow Christ, um, the distinction would be don't become a photocopy of me if I'm leading you away from Jesus, the way of Jesus. And I think sometimes that our, our photocopies um, become unhelpful because God made you unique and we don't like to be outsiders. And I wanted to to reflect on that, to encourage people, um, not necessarily to go around kind of elbowing everyone out of their way, 
like, you know, very self-centered kind of way of doing life, like give me room to be me, but also to refuse to merely become um, a version that someone else wants you to be. Be God made you, as a, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, that you're God's masterpiece. You're his workmanship cr um, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And so in the third post, I, t I talk a little bit about sometimes the convictions that make us outsiders. And so being an outsider can be a result of, you know, creative genius. It could be a result of our quirky personality. It could be a result of a number of things, but one of them can be at times this desire to, to speak up. And we all know, even when no one else is, and we all know what it feels like to, to kind of laugh at the joke that, you know, isn't funny. Um, mm. or to have this deep sense of this isn't right, but no one else is saying it. And so the quote is often attributed to C.S. Lewis, but it's not a, a, I don't believe it's a Lewis quote, but it's this, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And that quote is powerful because if you've ever been in that position, you feel like you're, you're the one in the wrong. And so I have a section in this post that I call no profit margin, and it's the profit is P-R-O-P-H-E-T. And I talk about often, it's sad that some of the people I love and respect, people that you and I probably, the person who might come to your mind, Carmen, or some of the people we would we would share in common, um, it's sad that sometimes nonprofits don't make room for their profits. And mm. people I love and respect have had to step away from places where their prophetic voice was muted. And so I think it's important for us to not say, like, just say what you want and and no matter what the consequences are. I, I'm not saying be careless, but I'm saying don't be quiet when you know something's wrong. Um, and I also include a little reflection on this about social media. I had someone recently, you know, talk to me about how do you kind of navigate things when you're affiliated with an organization for you with a radio program, for me with the university in terms of social media, like saying things that may not represent the whole. And so I want to reflect on that too. Like how do we live this out in public in places, even this might seem kind of superfluous or insignificant or trivial places like social media. And I think what we have to do is not say things that are unnecessarily um, harmful or frustrating but there are times when we need to speak the truth. And I also think that we need to consider, and this may seem like I'm going in a million directions, and maybe I am. Um, but I think sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on people who say the thing that rocks the boat. But mm -hmm. what about what about inappropriate silence? And that's what I said to my friend who asked me about these of social media. I said, what about when someone's silence doesn't reflect my values? Why do we only get concerned when someone rocks the boat? Sometimes the boat needs to be rocked. Um, but other times our silence is a sign that we're becoming a photocopy. So let's make sure that we speak what's necessary and true um, and appropriate. But if we need to speak, let's speak and let's stand by it. And if there are consequences, um, when you stand by what you said, you just face the consequences. So that's post three. So... Yes. And so I want to give you a couple of minutes to talk about post four, but the person who just came to mind who might be a really, really interesting conversation partner, if this if this were to grow into a project of some kind, mm -hmm. um, would be would be John Cooper mm. from Skillet. <laughs> because I feel like he is authentically himself in Christ mm -hmm. and yeah. with just so straightforward a, an approach to the conversations. I mean, calling out, it's calling stuff out when he sees it. And he has the, yeah. you know, he's an, he's like an outsider who's on the inside. Like it's, you know, that yeah. has to be a, a very, very scratchy, very scratchy place to live. So um, talk about, talk about part four. And again, we're talking with Daniel DeWitt. This is a series of posts at theolatte.com really entering into and unpacking the conversation about the photocopy syndrome. You were created by God as an original to be an original. Um, and yet, if you are like um, many of us, there are ways that you have conformed yourself, your ideas, your patterns of life, your way of speaking, whatever it is, you have conformed yourself to fit in 
Um, and maybe that's just not what we're called to be in Christ. So talk about um, the fourth part of this series. Yeah, I, th- I think it's important to to know you're never going to find the a, a utopia. You're not going to find a mm-hmm. place where you just are totally liberated to be who you are. And that's, that, that's, that's not entirely bad. Like we need checks and balances. We need people who sharpen us and encourage us and and challenge us when we're in the wrong. Um, but I think that one of the things we have to do is as much as we can to find the kind of cultures where we can make a meaningful contribution and then also where we can flourish. I include a quote in this post from Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was a, a, a pastor, a writer, um, an activist. He was a mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. And he once said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Now, there are ways we could take that quote in the wrong direction, but I think this idea of finding those deep convictions, and as Christians, we would say those are convictions that are um, in following after Jesus and, and being true to what Jesus has called you to do, taking those convictions and letting them bring us to life and not muting them. And so in this final post, I wanted to, to say this is a challenge for every person Christian or non-Christian, to be authentic to their convictions. But particularly for the Christian, we have um, in Scripture a a way to deal with this. The Apostle Paul, his great, you know, his most influential writing on love, 1 Corinthians 13, it's, it's recited at weddings more than any other passage, and it has nothing to do with romantic love. If you read the preceding chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about how in community they were struggling to live out and use their gifts. And at the end of that chapter, that's about how do you work together when one person thinks their gifts are better than another person, and there's this struggle to, for them to be authentically who God created them to be. Paul ends that chapter by saying, I will show you a more excellent way. Mm. And I think his more excellent way is the way we need to consider today to not become photocopies. And that more excellent way is the way of love. And so as we love one another, encourage one another to use our gifts in a way that edifies the body, in a way that glorifies God, that's the kind of culture where we don't become photocopies. We actually want to encourage others to be more of who God created you to be. And I end the the series um, with a paraphrase from St. Augustine, who said, love God and do as you will. And I I paraphrase that to say, love God and be yourself. Um, Because what we need are people who are authentic to who God made them to be and people who've come alive with the love of God and want to see all of those gifts flourish in the world in a way that's for the good of others, but also want to see others flourish in their individual callings as well. That's so good. Pattern, patterning our lives after Christ, but not um, not after the ways of the world. It's so good. It's such an encouragement. Thank you so much. That's Dan DeWitt. You can find what we were talking about today at Theolatte.com. Also check out the Worldview Reader this week. Um, all right. So as we close up this hour together, just a, um, just a shout out to those of you on the text line um, that were reflecting on the adoption conversation earlier Um Thank you for your stories. Thank you for your testimonies. Natasha, we're so glad that the Lord delivered you, um, not only through your mom, but into the hands of um, of precious caretakers at an orphanage in Russia. And we thank you that you are now a part of a, not only an adopted family in Madison, Wisconsin, um, but that you're a part of the Faith Radio family as well. So to God be the glory in the way that he's knitting us all together as a forged family here at Faith Radio. We've got another hour together up next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.